Hello and welcome to the Natural Balance Hoof Care Corner. We're going to continue on with hoof distortions this week. Uh, we just started, uh, we, we left off with how the frog influences the arrangement of the back of the foot and how it keeps the curls out of it and stuff, but uh, the hoof uh, becomes distorted uh, because of its natural design. If you remember back in the earliest s segment of when we talked about foals, we, we mentioned that the foals actually had a deformed foot before they uh, touched it to the ground. And it was because of that influence that straightened the back quarters out, the, the heels became straighter, the bars uncurled, all of that stuff. And that needs to be continued on through the horse's life. It seems as though if the horse is idle and, or is shod routinely and the, the shoes are placed uh, too far forward on the foot, uh, the toe first landing, and all of those different things cause uh, the beginning of hoof distortions. And I want to show you just a little bit about the, just the design of the foot and how it sets itself up for distortion unless we become aware of how to overcome that. If you look at how the foot uh, from this perspective, if you look at the widest part here, there's the widest part at the hairline, there's the widest part on, this hair, on the side that has the hair on it. I'm going to show you some graphics to correlate this. I want to try to properly orient you to what's going on here. If you look at this segment here, you see the line that's drawn down through the foot represents this widest part of the foot that I've just shown you right here. It's a different widest part of the foot as viewed from the bottom. If you look at the foot from this view, as you see over on the right here, I'm drawing a line down through this segment. The widest part of the sole surface or the ground surface is farther forward than this widest part here. It's easy enough to find you, if you measure back from the apex of the frog back approximately one inch, one inch, it varies some from a small foot to a large foot. It's, but it's generally where the bars intersect right here, intersect here. And if you draw a line across there, you'll see that that's basically the widest part of the foot. And you say, well, what's so important about the widest part of the foot? The thing is that it uh, is the part from this part back. It's the most. It is the flexible part of the foot. The part that is widest at the hairline is the widest part of the bony structures of the foot. For instance, the coffin bone. If you look at this graphic again, I'll try to illustrate it here. If you see this structure here where this line starts, this is represented, this is a view taken straight down at 90 degrees from the ground this way straight down this way. You have to perceive this drawing as being taken from that view. This is the coffin bone here. Illustrated in yellow is the lateral cartilage. The blue segment is the bottom end of P2, which is this bone right here. And of course the navicular bone is just slightly behind that when viewed from the top. Okay. Now, look at the, look at the actual structures here. I've drawn a, an apex at this widest part of the foot at the hairline because this part of the foot is not flexible and it does come to a peak right there. From that part to the rear, it starts to come inward. Do you see this? It starts from this widest spot, comes inward. So it's already contracted. Unless there's something there to hold this foot apart, this foot will continue to contract. It's very important that you understand that. This is the part that is designed to move laterally. The ground surface from here at the widest part of the sole to the widest part at the hairline is generally in line with the horn tubules. You see that? So this part of the foot is designed to move laterally at this angle along here. If you've ever had a quarter crack, you'll see that it'll follow a line generally at this widest part because that's the part that is not flexing as it's supposed to. So it cracks and breaks to weaken it so that it can move that way. 
It's very easy, very simple to understand. Mother Nature is trying to do what she can to make all of these problems go away. Simply a quarter crack is just a means to get the foot to move when it's being inhibited by uh, improper maintenance. So back to the graphics now. You'll see that if there's no contact with the frog or dirt compaction, you'll see that the frog, the, the heels have a tendency to move inward. Usually, when we talk about which came first, the chicken or the egg, when we talk about hoof distortion, we see the toe having an influence on the heels becoming contracted. As a rule, with most farriers, uh, the, the tendency is to try to keep the pasture in line, and it's a struggle sometimes with a lot of feet, particularly those that have heels that grow underneath in this direction. Those hooves that have a natural tendency to not have an upright foot were never intended to have an upright heel and therefore the heel grows at a different angle than some of the more clubby or upright feet. These are the ones that are oftentimes misunderstood. Simply trying to grow heel on a foot like this can be the worst thing that can happen. It's the very essence of what causes hoof distortion. Simply trying to leave that heel only encourages it to become curled because it takes the frog out of the ground. This particular type foot is so reliant on contact to keep those heels uncurled and well spread that if you lose that, either the dirt compaction or the frog contact, you lose the ability to keep that hoof wide enough at the very back. So quite often farriers will trim the toe closer than it needs to be and at that point in time the toe, if trimmed too close, will just migrate forward. That encourages the farrier, the hoof care practitioner, to leave even more heel. So it's an ongoing perpetual thing. I've done it in my early years as a farrier and it was the most confusing thing I've ever uh, done to try to overcome a problem when in fact I was just creating an even worsened problem. So as I was trimming the toe close, leaving the heels tall, I just perpetuated and set myself up for a pathological situation. So this is basically it in a nutshell. So you have to deal with both of the ends of the spectrum at the same time. You have to deal with leaving enough toe, which doesn't make sense or didn't make sense to me, and trimming the heel back to overcome the pasture alignment. Now we just got through looking at what influences the frog had in lining the pasture and that's the secret ingredient. Getting the frog engaged, creating a heel first landing will be an assurance that you're going to have an aligned pasture at the, the most opportune time, at the most important time. Well, as usual, we're out of time, uh, and it seems like at, uh, at a time when uh, we really need to go on about uh, this very important subject. So we're going to continue on with this hoof distortion issue. We're going to talk about the back of the foot, the front of the foot, and what causes our perception of, uh, of the foot to be skewed by the hoof distortions. Thank you again.